Good afternoon. If you're here for the um, information session about a potential pan-Canadian formulary, we'll be starting momentarily. Thank you for joining. Okay, hello and welcome to our information session on a proposed framework for a potential pan-Canadian formulary. My name is Heather Logan and I'm the Executive Strategy Lead at CADF. I am delighted to be moderating today's session. We're joined by our co-chairs, Mr. Uh, Alan Lefebvre and Dr. Alexandra King, who will be sharing details of the work of the advisory panel. Alexandra is an internal medicine specialist with a focus on HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, uh, and HIV, and the conditions that often accompany those diseases. Alexandra is a member of the Nipissing First Nation in Ontario and the CAMCO Chair in Indigenous Health and Wellness um, at the University of Saskatchewan. Alan has served in several management and volunteer leadership capacities, primarily um, in the charitable and not-for-profit uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. Alan is a former public member of the CADF Canadian Drug Expert Committee, also known as CDEC and has been a, pu a public representative on the Drug Advisory Committee in Saskatchewan uh, since 2010. Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which our Toronto offices are operate where I am based. Um, it is the land of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are privileged and honored to be able to live and work on this land. Next slide, please. So for this session, we'll be sharing the background, context, and overview of the panel's work and how you can be involved. Um, and at the end, we'll be taking some questions. We encourage you to type the questions you have into the Q&A box. You'll see that on the bottom um, bar, it's Q&A, and just open that up and uh, post your questions. We will do our best to answer them, knowing we expect to have more today than we can answer today, um, but we will do our best today and to follow up afterwards on our website. For questions, again, that we're unable to get to, we will review and post those uh, on the website on the Frequently Asked Questions section. You may be already interested to know if you haven't found them, we've published some general FAQs about this work, so you can see that on our website. We've shared a discussion paper uh, and questions for feedback in advance of the session. As such, it's a great opportunity today for you to seek clarification a little bit on uh, what we're uh, focusing on uh, through the session today and afterwards. We recognize that many Canadians, uh, sorry, session objectives, let me cover that first. We recognize uh, that we have three uh, objectives for you today. Number one, to share information about the advisory panel's work. Number two, obviously to provide details on how stakeholders can submit feedback. So you'll know how after today, you can make sure we hear from you directly. And then to answer any questions from those who are on the line today, um, to help you think about how you might wanna to respond, to make sure you're positioned well to answer uh, the questions in the survey. Next slide, please. We recognize that many Canadians cover the cost of their prescription drugs through a combination of public uh, drug plans, private drug plans, and out-of-pocket po payment. However, many individuals in Canada currently lack adequate coverage to afford the drugs that they need. For example, in a 2019 report titled A Prescription for Canada, Achieving Pharmacare for All, found that nearly 3 million Canadians said they were not able to afford one or more of the drugs that they had been prescribed. And almost a million Canadians had cut back on food or home heating, uh, timely given where we are today, and all the snow in Ontario, in order to pay for their prescription drugs, or have borrowed money to pay for them. The nature of work is also changing. More people are working part-time, are self-employed, or are contract workers, and often as a result do not have um, full health benefits. Women, young people, new Canadians and immigrants uh, also are all more likely to work in part-time or contract positions and therefore leave those groups without adequate drug coverage in some circumstances because of the type of work that they do. Against this backdrop, there is a desire to have a conversation about developing a pan-Canadian formulary. Next slide, please. So before we start, I'd like to cover some information about a formulary. For many on the line, this will not be new. For some, it may be. Um, as the concept of a formulary can be quite complex, we want to describe by what we mean by a pan-Canadian formulary and highlight the scope of the panel's work. 
Um, from this point forward, rather than saying the rather cumbersome potential pan-Canadian formulary, you'll hear us refer to it simply as formulary, that our intent is potential pan-Canadian formulary. A formulary generally consists of a list of drugs that are covered by a health plan. It typically contains a description of each product that is listed. It may also contain information to support um, prescribing, dispensing, administration, and sometimes interchangeably between interchangeability between drug products. As part of this work, the panel was asked to consider related products. So these are things, devices typically, that assist with the delivery or administration of a drug. Um, this could include products like spacer devices or, uh, for beater dose inhalers uh, for those who have asthma or respiratory conditions or blood glucose strips to test blood sugar levels in those who have diabetes or sugar related issues. The goal of a formulary is to include a range of safe, effective, evidence-based drugs and related products that meet the healthcare needs of Canada's diverse population. There are several elements, um, <clears throat> pardon me, Lee, involved in creating a formula, and you'll see those listed as one through five at the bottom of the slide. Number one, looking at terms of coverage. So the eligibility criteria or who would be covered by a product, often that is by drug specific criteria or in a class of similar or related drugs. Two is a process for creating a drug list or a formulary. So what is included on that formulary and why is it included or why not? Three, ways to manage the formulary. So in other words, how to maintain a list that would have the best drugs with the best available evidence and offer the most value to Canadians. Four, how that formulary or process would be financed, specifically who or what group funds it. And five, who makes the decisions? Is the listing decision made by a group, by an organization, or by a single individual designated within a jurisdiction to make those final decisions? And I would like to follow um, this comment by indicating that the decision today, the decisions rather, about whether and how to implement a formulary uh, really rest with provincial, federal, and territorial decision makers. So the panel's work was to identify a process uh, and some out parameters around uh, a framework for that formulary, not to determine how necessarily it would be implemented. So the scope of the work is highlighted and really focused on numbers two and three, which you'll see uh, bolded um, and also with a red box around it on the screen. Next slide, please. So the ask, how did CADF get involved in this and, and the multidisciplinary advisory panel? In order to support two and three in the slide previous in the red box, we were asked to set up a time limited advisory panel. Uh, it was established, and I draw your attention to the left-hand side, and really indicate that the panel was asked to develop principles and a framework to guide a uh, potential pan-Canadian formulary, to create a proposed sample list of commonly prescribed drugs and selected related products as a test case based on a subset of therapeutic areas. So we will flag at this point, the work of the panel is a small set of drugs, most commonly used, and we'll tell you how we, the, we, the panel came up with that list. It is not a fully complete list, that is work still to be done. And number three, to establish criteria and a transparent process that could expand the proposed sample list to other therapeutic areas beyond those that the panel did consider, and how new products could be added, and a list would be maintained over time. Finally, on the right-hand side, I will explain we, we were asked to conduct a stakeholder engagement process, and this is a critical first step in that uh, commitment. So we uh, obviously are speaking to you today about the panel's draft work. We will also have an online survey, <clears throat> pardon me, for you to share your views with us. And the panel will be reconvened again uh, to make sure that we have an opportunity to share that input for the panel to consider it before the final report is submitted. Next slide, please. So very importantly, before we start is to talk about what's out of scope. We've told you what was in scope, but it's important to talk about what's out of scope because these are areas that the panel uh, co-chairs today will not be able to answer questions. And the panel was really not directed to focus on these areas. So number one, an assessment of current drug plan processes or expectations about whether or how coverage on existing drug plans might be affected by potential pan-Canadian formula or a formulary. In other words, if you're sitting in a particular jurisdiction and access your drugs through a particular formulary, the panel did not consider how that formulary interacted with this potential pan-Canadian formulary. Number two, um, the identification of governance structures to implement a potential pan-Canadian formulary. Um, really, which organization might be best situated to do that was also out of scope and is in the hands of the decision makers. Number three, uh, consideration of financing issues, for example, funding allocation, financing contributions, funding models, budget scope, 
size and amount or individual drug plan budgets or projected estimates for those budgets. Number five, defining terms for coverage. For example, patient contributions like co-payments or deductibles and patient eligibility. And I mentioned criteria in the previous slide. That was out of scope. That is very specific work that would follow uh, later on. And finally, consideration of the interplay between pu public and private insurance plans. This is a big area. I know there are a lot of private and public insurance representatives on the call. This specific area was out of scope for the panel. And then of course, there are numerous ongoing pharmaceutical initiatives such as the rare diseases strategy work that Health Canada and the provinces and territories are involved in. And that is out of scope for the panel's work. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So this is perhaps the proudest part of the work is the advisory panel itself. The uh, advisory panel is composed of two co-chairs, both of whom are here today, and 12 members. We deliberately recruited members from across Canada to represent diversity across gender, culture, race, and geography. The panel brings together a range of expertise and experience, including healthcare providers, nursing, pharmacy, and medicine, those who have lived and living experience, people living with Indigenous and other communities, often made vulnerable through a combination of social and economic policy, and individuals with a background in ethics, because we talk about choice, obviously, in the panel, health policy, and, off, and as well, drug plan leadership. And you can see the CADETH website for details about the advisory panel, including their conflicts of interest that were declared. Next slide, please. So an overview of the project. To help set the stage, we created a roadmap. So we uh, had a series of panel meetings starting in July. We had uh, five panel meetings. They were very quick, uh, long, intense meetings, but we had them in quick succession. So that was July to September. Now we're at the point of stakeholder engagement. After this period from January to the end of February, we will resume panel meetings and bring forward all of the feedback that has been shared through the stakeholder engagement process. We will come back to you again and invite you to listen to how the panel took in your comments and what changed as a result of those, that feedback. And then the final report will be due to Health Canada at the end of June. I will flag on the bottom of the slide and you will see this on our website that you will have an opportunity to provide written feedback um, from January 11th last week to February 25th. So we hope that gives you a little bit longer than might ordinarily be the case given the complexity of this work. Next slide, please. Stakeholder engagement. Uh, so we wanna share how you can be involved in this work. Next slide. Engagement with stakeholders is foundational to what CADF does, and this is no different. Your input will be used, as I mentioned earlier, to inform the final report that will be submitted to Health Canada, shared with provincial and territorial governments, and made publicly available. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. By submitting your written feedback to CADF, the submitting organization or individual agrees to the full disclosure of the information. I want this to be really clear to folks, so if you are uncomfortable with that, um, please just bear that in mind. Secondly, submissions received will be posted on CADA's website so you too can see the kind of feedback that has been received. And finally, you will be asked to provide CADA with certain personal information, including name, contact information, and affiliation at the time of your submission, but we will not release that information, obviously. Finally, and I mentioned previously, we will hold a webinar in the spring of 2022 so you can hear from the panel again how they interpreted your feedback and what changed as a result. Next slide, please. So, Again, how to be involved. Thank you for attending today. We had over 1,100 people registered for today's session, and it will be available after, so you can watch it as can others. We invite you to download the discussion paper. The link is here. It provides a summary of the panel's work, as well as questions that are embedded within the discussion guide and are in an online questionnaire. So as you read the content, you can think about the questions and then go to the survey secondarily. Uh, review the questions and submit a response. So again, the link to that survey is there. And please, we have included free text response fields so you can tell us what you think in addition to answering questions. The online feedback deadline is February 25th. Next slide, please. So questions for feedback. We have uh, specifically, the panel has been asked uh, to provide a framework and a process for developing a formulary. So we'd like you to talk to us about the process that the panel used. Help us understand your views. The questions in the survey will include topics such as the principles, which Alan is going to speak to, among other things, to guide the development and maintenance of a formulary. The assessment criteria used to develop the sample list of commonly prescribed drugs. Also looking at standard definition and criteria for related projects, uh, products. Have we been, has the panel been comprehensive enough? Have we missed things? 
um, to look at the proposed criteria to expand into other th therapeutic areas, knowing that this was intended to be a sample and a start, not the full comprehensive formulary. Also to provide us feedback on alternatives to the current first in, first out submission process. And finally, uh, proposed criteria and the considerations for selecting and evaluating new products that come to market. We have a vibrant and continue to hope to have a vibrant pharmaceutical R&D community in Canada and abroad and hope those products come to Canada. And finally, mo uh, formulary modernization strategies to ensure sustainability uh, and other factors. Next slide, please. And I think at this point, I am going to hand this over to our first co-chair, Alan. Alan, over to you. Thanks, Heather. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, here today. Your input and involvement into this process is really uh, is important, and we're looking forward to, uh, to receiving your feedback and once you've had a chance to review the documents and, uh, and respond to us. I want to also take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the work, incredible work of this panel. It's a very engaged and very exciting group of people to be involved with, and they've brought uh, put considerable thought into these issues. And uh, also want to thank Heather and her team. Uh, you guys have done a tremendous amount of work uh, bringing this uh, to the point where we're at today. So I'm going to start uh, looking at the work of the advisory panel and breaking it down into really three parts. Uh, Alexander and I uh, together will expand on these over the next uh, little bit and then hopefully we'll have lots of time to get into some questions. So part one outlines how the principles of the formulary were formula, uh, sorry, how the principles for the formulary were created. Uh, part two, we'll get into the three stage approach that we use to generating the proposed sample list and growing the list, list over time and maintaining it. And then in part three highlights the opportunities and how this work could help to enhance the existing processes that already exist in the country. I'll be talking about uh, parts one and three and Alexander will be guiding us through number two. So the proposed framework, um, this slide uh, kind of encompasses or depicts uh, graphically, I guess, what we've uh, been doing. And it's, you can see that it's encircled and really guided by the six principles that we're proposing. It's the circle that goes around the outside. Inside the, the three stages of what we did, uh, the proposed, uh, for the proposed approach to this formulary, uh, the first stage, which, which Heather's talked about, is that we created this sample list. Uh, to test our proof of concept as to how to proceed. The second stage, which is work yet to be done, would be to scale and expand that to include all therapeutic areas, not just the three that we've selected. And the third stage is really about adding new products on an ongoing basis and maintaining this, uh, maintaining the list really uh, for its ongoing lifetime. In developing this approach, the panel also discussed a number of key elements that I think are essential for creating and maintaining the formulary. Uh, such as the, the continued use of deliberative processes for selecting products, uh, something that's done now, uh, including and the evaluation of therapies and developing uh, the listing of recommendations by expert committees, which include appeal processes. And the approach also involves evolves and builds on the strengths of the policies and procedures currently used by CADETH and the various drug plans now. So we're not trying to completely reinvent the wheel. Uh, we, we want to uh, adapt the wheel, I guess, and, and do a bit of a redesign or make some suggestions as about how it can be adapted to, uh, to, to more appropriately uh, fit into a national uh, um, uh, formulary. We also want to see the development of formulary modernization strategies that maintain alignment of the formulary with current evidence as it evolves. And this is uh, an area that is done to some degree now in the country, but I think needs, needs more work and needs a different approach as we go forward. As noted on the bottom of this slide, we also feel it's important that there's a procedural fairness process where stakeholders can engage and understand the rationale behind decisions. I think as Heather mentioned earlier, the uh, you know stakeholder engagement is a really key piece of what CADETH does in all areas, and that's going to be no different here. And you're going to hear me repeat uh, some elements of this uh, a number of times as I go through the next several slides. So we'll dive a little deeper now into the, the principles that we've identified. So as you can see from um, this bubble diagram, we have identified six guiding principles. These have become the foundation of our overall approach uh, to all of our recommendations here. Uh, you'll probably recognize that these are really rooted in the five principles of the Canada Health Act, uh, principles that were also reinforced by the Advisory Council on the Implementation of National Pharmacare uh, in their 2019 report. Uh, we've refined it and, and expanded these a bit to suit uh, what are the work we're doing here today, but that's, that's its basis. It's important to note that none of these are ranked in order of importance, uh, nor does do any of them stand alone. They're all they influence, balance, support, and build on each other. 
Uh, we recognized that at times there may be tension between these principles. For example, uh, tension between equity and timeliness uh, may conflict with sustainability and that careful balancing will be required on an ongoing basis and decision making at all times must be accompanied by transparent justification for any trade-offs. So I'll go into these in a little more detail. Hopefully you've uh, had a chance to review the, uh, the, the draft document that's been on the website now for a while. Uh, page 10 of that discussion paper uh, is where there's a full description uh, of, of these principles and I certainly encourage you to, to have a look at that if you haven't already. You'll also notice that in table one, uh, there's we've included values for each one of the principles and two different kinds of values, a content value and a process value. The content value is really a guide as to which drugs should be included in the formulary and why, and the process values, which are guides as to how the system should function and how decisions should be made. So the first principle on the next slide is universal and integrated. The st a strong focus on universal access for all Canadians is really the cornerstone of the panel's recommendations. You know, the, it reads all people in Canada should have access to drug, their drug needs regardless of the diversity characteristics. And we've listed a number of the examples, We're certainly not limited to these, but these are the things we consider to be the diversity characteristics that need to be taken into consideration. The second principle is effective and high quality. Our focus here is on setting a high standard for health and patient experiences in the Canadian context. Uh, we believe that choices should be based on an evaluation of the options and should be viewed in the context of both the benefit to patients individually and the Canadian population as a whole. Being effective and high quality also means the formulary must be continuously improved and that's something we'll come back to a little later as well. Sustainability is the next uh, key piece. Long-term thinking and the sustainability of the formulary is essential. Uh, to be blunt, an unsustainable approach will by definition fail and of course be of limited benefit to anyone. Efficient, being efficient and timely uh, is, is uh, the next one. Uh, really it's about getting the right drugs to the right patient at the right time. And it, this is essential for good health and really is a foundational principle for us. The development of this new national formulary, uh, I see it as a golden opportunity to rethink processes that minimize duplication of steps and delays in the process. We believe that to meet relevant patient health goals, decision-making processes need to be efficient and as seamless as possible to ensure timely access to prescription drugs by patients. Again, the right drug at the right time. Inclusive, transparent, and fair. Uh, this is what Heather mentioned, but we and we uh, will reinforce several times in here. But in a nutshell, we strongly believe that the formulary development, operation, and evaluation should be undertaken uh, with a view through the various lenses of multiple stakeholders. Uh, these stakeholders include patients, healthcare providers, health organizations, governments, industry, and people with lived and living experience, including caregivers. And equitable is the uh, final, uh, the, the sixth of the six, uh, of the six uh, principles we've identified here. Um, and, you know, the panel spent a considerable amount of time discussing equity and the lack of equity that currently exists because of the gaps that exist in the patchwork of public and private plans that we have now in the country. Heather mentioned some of these at the beginning about where, you know, the change of, changing of work and, 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 the, and the number of people that fall between the cracks and don't, uh, don't have uh, access to the drugs that they need. This principle really embodies probably the most important shift in thinking and where a lot of our recommendations, uh, changes in, in process and procedures will lie. I'd like to uh, highlight two particularly important parts of this definition. Uh, the first, equity recognizes that individuals have different circumstances that require a variable allocation of resources to provide opportunities to achieve equal outcomes. Importantly, this does not mean that people, all people have equal access to the same drugs. It's about access to therapies that will achieve equal outcomes. Second, regarding closing of gaps in access to prescription drugs, current policies and processes have both intended and often unintended consequences that result in variable access. Depending on who you are and where you live, we believe this needs to change. Addressing equity issues would help to make drugs and related products more accessible for all people living in Canada, especially to those who currently do not have access for reasons beyond their control, including both historic and contemporary inequities. We understand that more equitable access to prescription drugs will not solve all equity issues, but it's an important step in the right direction. 
keeping these six principles in mind, part two of the panel's work involved developing an approach to actually create the formulary. And for this, I'll hand it over to Alexander for this part. Um, thank you, Alan. Uh, hello, everybody. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be presenting this work uh, along with Alan on behalf of our esteemed panel. Um, to build on Alan's section, part two of this work outlines our approach to developing the proposed sample list, determining the steps on how such a list might be expanded to other therapeutic areas, and, and processes used to add on to and maintain such a list over time. Next slide, please. We felt the creation of a formulary was best done through a staged approach. I will share the details of each stage briefly. Stage one involves creating a sample list of drugs and related products. This stage is meant to be a starting point, testing the process as proof of concept. Uh, to see which product was included in the sample list, uh, please refer to appendix two in the discussion uh, paper. Stage two involves scaling the process so that the sample list could be expanded to include products in other therapeutic areas. Before growing such a list, we felt that it was important to ensure that the process used in stage one is reviewed through this consultation and revised as appropriate. Once uh, all therapeutic areas are covered, stage three involves a process of adding new drugs and related products that come onto the Canadian market. That is, how could they be evaluated and considered for listing? As with any formulary, it is important to have strategies on how a proposed list could be maintained over time to ensure its sustainability. Next slide, please. So the next few slides will get into the details of stage one um, in which the proposed sample list is created. Next slide, please. So we explored several approaches to creating a formulary list. Because there was a fixed amount of time in which to perform the analysis and make recommendations, we decided on a pragmatic approach. We proposed a sample list of drugs and related products as a starting point and test case. The objective here was to make sure that this work was aligned with the proposed principles that Alan has already presented. Our approach was to select three therapeutic areas. The drugs in a handful of related products were reviewed in these specific areas. We'll discuss the, th the three therapeutic areas in more detail uh, in the next slide. Uh, we had to make some assumptions and acknowledge the limitations associated with creating the proposed sample list. For example, comprehensive uh, data infrastructure is lacking. So we had to use available data gathered through many different sources when deliberating uh, the development of the proposed sample list. You can refer to appendix one in the discussion paper to read about the limitations and assumptions we made. Next slide, please. The three therapeutic areas selected were cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and psychiatric illnesses. These therapeutic areas were selected because they involved drugs with the highest utilization rates, where diseases with the most significant and growing prevalence and account for high numbers of clinical, sorry, clinician visits uh, and or hospitalizations in Canada. As you can see in the pie chart, of the top 10 therapeutic uh, classes presented, prescriptions for cardiovascular drugs, including antihyperlipidemics, diabetes drugs, and psychotherapeutic drugs together represent approximately 62% of the total dispensed in 2020. Next slide, please. Alexandra, it's Heather. Several participants are having trouble hearing you. If I could just ask you to speak a little bit louder, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the... Uh, um, okay, uh, so the next slide, please, methodology. This flow uh, chart outlines the methodology uh, to identify products that were ultimately included in the proposed sample list. The first step in developing the sample list was to identify drugs and related products for the three therapeutic areas. The list generated, uh, sorry, this generated an initial list of 394 products. Information was sourced from the WHO Anatomic Therapeutic Chemical or ATC classification system and the American Hospital Formulary Service or AHFS for drugs. 
certain drugs were removed based on predetermined criteria. These included the drugs were not available in Canada. The drugs were not approved for the treatment of conditions associated with the selected therapeutic area, or the drugs were used primarily in hospitals. This left us a total of 277 drugs and 10 related products. For the drugs and related products on the initial list, the following additional information, if available, was sourced. Um, formulary listing status, utilization data, safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding, whether or not it was on an essential medicines list, the availability of generic or biosimilars, and any references summarizing available drugs and use in Canada. I just wanna pause and see if the volume is better. Um, I'm hoping so. Um, this initial list of drugs and related products was then further refined through discussion about pre-specified um, uh, assessment criteria as outlined in table two in the discussion paper. I will get to this in the next slide. Each drug and related product were reviewed to determine if they would be included or excluded from the sample list or flagged for further consideration by experts. As I mentioned, many data sources were lacking uh, sorry, we used in, uh, in these discussions. And although there were some missing or incomplete data, decisions were based on considering the available uh, information in its totality. Next slide, please. The following three slides summarize the proposed assessment criteria and rationales we took into consideration when deliberating on individual drugs and related products. We will not be covering every point during this presentation, and so we really encourage you to read the discussion paper for additional details. When going through each product and selecting drugs for the proposed sample list, we were mindful not to widen access gaps. That is, we tried to make consistent recommendation for drugs that have a similar listing status across jurisdictions. We paid particular attention to drugs needed uh, by specific subpopulations for which um, access would be improved if they were included on the formulary. For example, drugs used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children or drugs used to treat substance use disorders. We reviewed the listing status on different provincial and territorial formularies along with the formulary for the non-insured health benefits or NIHB uh, program, which covers medications for eligible First Nations and Inuit clients. We considered the criteria and reasoning. Uh, for example, if a product supported greater drug adherence and um, reduced burden of administration or provided unique advantage. So for example, uh, route or frequency of administration. It was included in, on the sample list as it tied to the principles of effectiveness, efficiency, and quality. Another example is if a product was listed by all or most of the identified drug plans, for the most part, it was also included on the sample list. This tied to the principle of equity as well as universality and integration. Next slide, please. There were some products that we felt needed additional reviews before deciding whether uh, it should be included or excluded from the proposed sample list. For example, products were flagged for further consideration if there were questions about the potential therapeutic use or value or any potential safety issues. Some of these products were flagged for further consideration. They were generally thought to no longer uh, be standard of care or best practice for the specific therapeutic area. In linking back to principles of effectiveness, we felt additional review of various aspects of the drug or related product in this category was warranted. Next slide, please. So when recommending therapeutic, sorry, when recommending drugs and related products for exclusion from the proposed sample list, we wanted to ensure the rationale for decision was clearly stated. For example, 
The proposed criteria that we developed noted that a drug could be excluded if it had not been reviewed or had not or had received a negative recommendation from a Canadian health technology assessment body, or it was removed from the market by Health Canada at the time of the panel discussions. I want to mention here that this work was done at a point in time. And so as such, the proposed sample list overall would need to be reviewed periodically as part of the formulary modernization process. Um, Alan will share more details about this in later slides. Uh, Next uh, slide, please. So in terms of uh, the results from the deliberation, I mentioned earlier that we reviewed 277 drugs and 10 related products or 287 items in total. Of this total, 204 products were included, 54 products were flagged for further consideration, and 29 products were excluded from the sample list. A detailed list of which drugs and related products fell under each category can be found in Appendix 2 of the discussion paper. Next slide, please. We would also like to highlight a few points that came up during the, the panel's discussion. As mentioned earlier, we placed weight on equity considerations to help reduce barriers to access and meet the needs of specific subpopulations. We also felt it was important to consider mechanisms to ensure sustainability. For example, if biosimilars or generics are available for a particular drug molecule, it was important that the least costly product could be selected and prioritized for listing. Although cost considerations were out of scope of our mandate, we believe it is critical to include a few points that may facilitate the sustainability of a formulary. Next slide, please. As part of the proposed sample list, we considered combination products. They were included if each component of the combination was also included in the proposed sample list. For example, the combination product of metformin and linagliptin was included because each of these were included individually on the sample list. Um, Over-the-counter products that are part of usual treatment, such as acetosilic acid, were assessed in the same way as prescription drugs. However, we acknowledge that further restrictions for over-the-counter products, such as a requirement of a prescription to have it reimbursed, may be necessary to ensure appropriate and judicious use. Next slide, please. We also recommended having uh, more than one choice of a drug molecule within each class or category, and if possible, more than one supplier. The intent of providing options is to manage issues caused by drug supply shortages, allow for patient and clinician preference, and address medical need. Overall, we recommended additional refinement to the proposed sample list particularly for drugs and related products that have been flagged for additional consideration. This refinement could take the form of clinical expert consultations or reviews of the safety, relative clinical and or cost effectiveness, particularly where there were multiple drugs available belonging to the same class, for example, benzodiazepines. As I noted earlier, the proposed list will need to be reviewed periodically, particularly um, when there is a new drug that could be added to a therapeutic class with many similar options or when the drugs, a drug's listing status changes from not listed to listed. Next slide, please. As part of this work, we also discussed related products. There are devices that assist in the administration of or are necessary for optimal drug use. We felt strongly that the inclusion of related products on a formulary should be explored because this would help improve patient access and could potentially uh, improve adherence with drug treatment. In many cases, these related products are covered through different programs within the health system, which makes accessing coverage difficult for patients. We saw this could be an opportunity to streamline the process, provide simplified access, and ultimately help patients access these types of products. 
However, we recognize the importance of having a standard set of criteria to help determine which related products should be eligible for inclusion. This standardization will be particularly important when assessing new or emerging technologies that could be numerous and costly and might impact sustainability. Next slide, please. We are now going to move to stage two, which is to consider applying the previous steps to other uh, therapeutic areas. Next slide, please. Process to grow the proposed list for the future. So the objective of um, this stage is to scale the process from stage one to expand the list to include drugs and re selected related products for all therapeutic areas. Given the large number of therapeutic areas that remain to be reviewed, a pragmatic approach needs to be identified to ensure gaps are not inadvertently widened or created. Next slide, please. So the proposed approach uh, will follow the previous steps from uh, stage one. This would include considering listing status from existing federal, provincial, or territorial formularies, drug utilization, availability of generic or biosimilar for this uh, drug molecule, information about safe use in pregnant and breastfeeding women, and references summarizing available drugs in use in Canada. These considerations would be supplemented with uh, literature reviews of uh, pharmacotherapeutic areas um, that have been shown to improve health outcomes in people made vulnerable by systemic inequities, uh, if available. In considering which therapeutic area to expand next, we had proposed that the therapeutic areas could be prioritized based on the national health priorities. So next slide, please. We recommend the proposed principles discussed earlier be applied. As part of uh, the refinement to the steps in stage one, we suggested that products listed under specialized programs, for example, those listed under cancer programs or special drug programs, be included because product listing and eligibility, among other aspects, may differ across the country and a gap could inadvertently be created. It was also proposed that a working group be formed with a mix of expertise to conduct reviews. The working group could be composed of key members with rotating expertise uh, for each specific area, for example, oncology or respirology. I'm now going to turn this back over to Alan to walk us through stage three as well as part three of the work. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. So once stage two is complete and all the therapeutic areas are covered, we'll move into stage three, which is really about adding new products as they come to market and maintaining the list over time. We recognize that it's certainly of significant benefit uh, for the health and wellness of patients uh, and the healthcare system as a whole uh, if, the, if the formulary is a complete formulary, not just uh, limited to a few therapeutic areas. So in terms of the selection of new drugs, uh, the current process for the review of new drug products is conducted really on a first in first out basis. Generally, I think of it as a conveyor belt based on the order of, uh, that submissions are filed typically by the manufacturer or the distributor of the product. Occasionally jurisdictions, uh, the drug plans, provincial drug plans initiate reviews, uh, but that's much less frequently. Because of the potentially high volume of submissions and limited available resources, uh, this method really doesn't sufficiently allow for priority setting, which is important if we want to have a value-based resource allocation of, of the products that are in the formulary. Therefore, the panel explored some alternative approaches to this first in, first out uh, to select new products for inclusion and discuss uh, the options that you see on the screen here. So the first option was to develop uh, a prioritization model that aligned with Health Canada's priority reviews. This would allow for a predictable process to uh, identify products that represent a significant therapeutic benefit advancement. We know that some of this work is already being jointly undertaken by CATA, Finesse and Health Canada, and, and a further development of this would support a seamless integration between these regulatory and HTA processes. However, it's not without uh, it's some challenges. For example, it doesn't address the inability to control when a submission is initiated, and it also excludes therapies that aren't necessarily receiving a priority review. 
So the second option we looked at was a, a clear and transparent scoring system that would prioritize all new drug submissions uh, to determine their um, the order that they would be reviewed in. Uh, so think these drugs wouldn't necessarily be re uh, reviewed in the order that they were received, but prioritized instead. For example, new innovative products that address unmet needs of a population could score higher and be addressed sooner. We would be interested in your feedback on what types of criteria might be important if this model were pursued uh, in terms of developing uh, that approach. Third option was explore opportunities to work together at an international level and review and prioritize products collectively. There's been some international collaborations in a number of different areas with regulatory and HTA processes, and this could be regularized with potential savings and resources and accelerated, ac accelerated access for both Canadians and international partners. I think it's important to realize that collective reviews of some kind, whether it's nationally or internationally, doesn't necessarily mean that all organizations would come to the same conclusion at the same time. I know I've been involved uh, on CDEC in examples where there has been uh, joint submissions that have gone through Health Canada and CDEC NNS, and CDEC NNS have come to different conclusions when we've, when we've looked at those drugs. Of course, we do have different systems and, and different procedures in place, but I think that's an important thing for people to realize. Uh, and these approaches are also not mutually exclusive. And maybe there's other options. Maybe you have some ideas on another approach that we should be including on this list that we haven't yet considered. Whatever options are considered, again, the panel feels strongly that transparency and strong engagement with the stakeholders is key as we move forward with this. So please tell us what you think in the feedback on this. I know the online form uh, asks you to select one of the three options. Feel free to use the comments to provide us any, with any additional information if you think a hybrid or some other option is, is, uh, is desirable. In terms of evaluation criteria, we considered six proposed criteria uh, and some additional considerations to guide the evaluation of new drugs and additions indications for the formulary. Four of these proposed criteria, really the, the four that are uh, in the center or on the right, the, the lighter blue circles, uh, are uh, applied in current Canadian deliberative frameworks. These are currently being done, whether it's by CDEC or NS or provincial uh, formularies or through PCPA when it comes to uh, negotiations with the manufacturers. We've added two additional criteria, the two darker circles on the left, uh, equitable access and additional considerations for long-term thinking to enhance this deliberative process. It's important to note that these proposed criteria are linked with the guiding principles. Table three in the discussion paper outlines these criteria and also provides our additional guidance on how each should be applied and the elements that would need to be taken into consideration when, you, when evaluating new products. And this is very clearly where the tension between some of these principles that we discussed earlier starts to come to the fore. Uh, we're not favoring one principle over the other, but we are recommending a transparent process that provides insight into the decisions. For example, the principle of health system sustainability is integrated into the proposed evaluation criteria of new drugs by considering the needs of Canadians over time. This is done by taking a long-term view and looking at the broader impact of a drug on the health of on, on the health system and on Canadian society, not just on the individuals. Examining the feasibility of adding a drug and recognizing the value society gains for the financial investment in the drug. Again, balance, I think, is a word that you know you're going to hear us probably say a few times, but really that's what this is about, is finding this balance. So please have a look at table three um, in the report uh, for details that aren't covered here today. Uh, but there are a couple things I'll highlight that are I think are not captured elsewhere. Uh, the first is value for money uh, includes a reference to uh, an issue of significant concern to patients and other stakeholders, namely uh, the development of cost modeling that captures unique subpopulations and costs that are outside the health system. Those are things typically right now not included in the economic analysis done for drugs uh, in the HTA process. Process. And the second point is additional considerations. Uh, really, that's a, a bit of a, a catch-all. You'll look at the document for the things that are included under that. But what's there is also a reference to real-world evidence and the potential for incorporating other ways of knowing, such as Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous ways of knowing, into the data set. And I think this really is, is key uh, as we move forward to look at the life cycle costing of drugs and the, and the review of some of these drugs. We need to be looking at data that goes beyond the clinical trials used to, to introduce them at the beginning. 
we also want to emphasize that the proposed criteria should not be considered separately. All six of these items should be together, should be considered together in the, in the deliberative process that's used uh, in the HTA evaluation. So they shouldn't be pieced out, you know, uh, an expert committee should look at the first four and, and a different committee look at the other two, they should all be part of the same, same process. So the proposed deliberative process, uh, as is currently the case in Canada, we believe that an expert committee should continue to be involved in evaluating and selecting products for the formulary. Uh, we think that deliberative processes must also continue to be used, although we're not com necessarily committed to the current model. As I said earlier, we think there's some tweaks that can be done and, and those are really tied back to those criteria that we I just mentioned. The panel explored an approach uh, um, to structure the delivery process that it could include weighing evidence from multiple disciplines and perspectives or specifically using something called a multi-criteria decision analysis or MCDA. A traditional form of MCDA involves three steps. You define the problem, you select criteria that reflect relevant values and you construct a performance matrix to score them. This method aims to enhance consistency and transparency by identifying, collecting and structuring information to support the decision process. We realize that there is no perfect approach to decision making and MCDA uh, is also has its limitations. There's no challenges in how criteria are defined or by whom. Uh, sorry, there are challenges in how criteria are defined and by whom. Uh, if the criteria are fixed or weighted, and if so, uh, who, who determines those preferences, how to determine opportunity costs and how to address uncertainty in the data. Nonetheless, similar processes are used in some of the provinces now, and we think it's worth considering this approach for the national formulary, particularly because of the additional criteria that we've identified. Whichever deliberative process is used, the panel again felt strongly that these processes underpinning the decision making as well as the rationale underlying uh, formulary decisions need to be transparent to stakeholders. Uh, the maintenance and modernization on the next slide. Uh, developing a way to maintain the formulary is essential to ensure that the drugs and related products are used in safe and appropriate cost effective manner going forward. Standard formulary management processes often include periodic or regular updates, and we felt uh, this would be an appropriate expectation for uh, pan Canadian formulary. This would ensure that the formulary is sustainable as well as evidence based effective and high quality on an ongoing basis. Formulary modernization is an approach to aligning formularies with current evidence, and this could and should include the reassessment of individual therapies, therapies uh, uh, the use of therapeutic reviews, and the assessment of prescribing guidelines for different diseases. For more information about these processes, again, I'd like to point you back to the discussion paper. I'd also, it's also worth noting that the panel had a lot of discussion about the need to incorporate a greater use of validated real-world evidence and life cycle data in this phase of the work. We believe that given how evidence evolves, uh, the process of drug and related product reimbursement should be iterative, responsive, evidence-driven, and patient-centered. Taking a life cycle approach to the review ensures system efficiency as reassessment supports alignment with current evidence, reallocation of resources to higher value care, and ensures optimal care, thereby improving patient outcomes. Again, we strongly recommend that all stakeholders have meaningful involvement in the formulary modernization process. So leveraging and, ex ex and sorry, leveraging and enhancing existing processes. Uh, and this last section, at least for me, explores the opportunities to leverage uh, what is currently being done in Canada. We felt it's important to ensure that this work can be adapted into existing structures and systems. Uh, the work should not create a duplication of processes, but rather uh, provide opportunities to enhance what currently exists. The universal and integrated principle that was at the forefront of our thinking was at the forefront of our thinking in exploring these opportunities. For example, we know there are already upper, there are already processes to review and evaluate products that are guided by existing committees. As such, we emphasize that there may be opportunities for existing expert committees to adapt the proposed criteria and considerations set out in Table 3 to enhance its current deliberative processes. Another opportunity would be to establish a centralized approach to reviewing and implementing drugs used in both community and hospital settings. We know that hospitals have separate formularies that may differ in, from public plans. And in certain cases, patients may experience gaps in treatments and even wastage of product when transitioning from hospital to community or reverse. Having a centralized formulary approach would improve continuity of care for patients. Last but not least, we know that 
the review and evaluation of new prescription drugs is a very complex area requiring expertise for many scientific and technical disciplines, as well as invaluable insights from the people lived or living uh, with lived or living experiences. Transparency efforts could be improved by fostering and maintaining dialogue between those affected by the recommendation and those making it. This dialogue could be enhanced by producing clear, publicly accessible and easy to understand communications. A robust appeal process could ensure procedural fairness by providing stakeholders with an opportunity to appeal if they feel a conclusion was reached in error. So with that, I will turn it back to Heather to recap and outline our next steps. Terrific, and thank you very much, Alan and Alexandra. Um, next slide, please. So we thought uh, we would just, before we open it up, cover a few important issues, uh, one of which is what was in a scope and what's out of scope for the panel. Uh, and I, I want to reflect, I, am, I thank you for your feedback to slow down or speak more loudly. It helps us make sure you can hear and absorb uh, and retain the information that we're sending. So thanks for that feedback. In terms of in scope, Remember, there were three areas that were asked, we asked the panel to focus on developing principles and a framework to guide a potential pan-Canadian formulary, or formulary in short. Two, to create a proposed sample list of commonly prescribed drugs and selected related products as a test case based on a subset of therapeutic areas um, that could be included in a formulary. And three, to establish criteria and a transparent process that could expand the proposed sample list to other therapeutic areas. So those three areas are, are certainly in scope and your questions uh, in those areas are very, very welcome. In terms of out of scope, and I will note, we have had a number of questions. Thank you so much for submitting. Feel free to continue to do so. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in that, that really fit into some of the out of scope topics, which is uh, as we expected. Um, so they're listed on the right hand side and I will flag um, two of the questions, er, th two of the question themes that have come in. One is uh, how will jurisdictions be involved, in particular several around Quebec's involvement. Again, I'll point to that being a discussion at the decision maker table. So our role is to come up with the panel uh, to support them in developing the list, the framework and a process. How that moves forward um, is, a, is a discussion for decision makers. Also around financing issues, um, there are several questions that have come up in the chat function that fit into the financing issue bundle. Um, so we will not be able to answer those today, but we all flag them and any of these questions will certainly be shared um, with the panel and ongoing in discussions with the federal government and the jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So I hope by the end of this, you will feel there is a real intent for us to hear directly from you. So if you haven't already, download the discussion paper. We've referenced it several times today, and we hope you find that informative and complete. Um, the, the online questionnaire opened last week, um, it, the survey rather, it will be open until the 25th of February, and we certainly invite you to provide your feedback. Knowing again, we will also bring you back again uh, for a second webinar in the spring of 2022. Next slide. So the online questionnaire, uh, here's the link. Uh, if you require uh, any clarification, please submit them through the Q&A box. But if you require input after the fact, remember you can reach us at requests at cadeth.ca. We will do our best to respond to you as quickly as, you can, as we can. You will note, for example, in the slides talking about stakeholder feedback that we have eight areas of question really aligning with the report and the panel's uh, recommendations, which are non-binding. Uh, we'd like your input on the proposed principles, the approach, uh, as well as other processes that you read in that document in terms of creating creation and maintenance of a, of a formulary. Next slide, please. So finally, we'll, we, that's the formal end of the presentation. I realize, we realize it is a lot of information to absorb and there, there will be questions today. And as you walk away and think about how to respond, you will have other questions. Um, so I invite you to put your questions into the Q&A box and uh, our co-chairs, panel co-chairs, will be answering questions. I'll be moderating. You'll, if you have submitted a question into the Q&A box, you'll notice that I may not read your question out verbatim. There may be several in the same theme. And so we'll try and lump them to answer as many common questions uh, with similar themes as we can. 
Um, so thank you very much, Alan and Alexandra. And I'm going to turn first to a question um, about the panel composition and representation. I'll offer some comments initially, and then I'll turn to you, Alexandra, and to you, Alan, to give your perspective as co-chairs of the uh, panel. So we've had several questions in the Q&A box about engaging patients in having a patient perspective in the panel. And I think, Alan, you can certainly speak to that knowing your role and um, Connie Cote's role representing um, patient-facing organizations literally across the country. Two, uh, have we engaged provincial plan experts who were involved in uh, formulary processes across the country? Um, three, would it have been too much to have industry involved in uh, the panel process? And four, what about pediatrics as a subset of critical population were their issues represented? So from a patient perspective, I wonder, Alan, if I might turn to you first and just your perspective on the panel's discussion representing patients and caregivers. Yep. Thanks, Heather. Um, first off, I think the, the one word that you used in that question, which was representing patients, and I think all of our panel members were very clear that they bring unique skills and knowledge to the table, but they don't represent that sector. I certainly did not pretend to try and represent all patients in Canada. Having said that, uh, and Connie as well, as a, you know, she's a, a member of a, a patient facing uh, organization. And so um, I, I think we bring those perspectives. I've had the benefit, I think, of seven years of reading all of the patient input that's come for every drug that's come through CDEC. Uh, so I think I have a reasonably good sense of the issues that patients have expressed to us regarding specific drugs along the way. And I certainly bring my own personal experiences to bear in our conversations. I think we were well represented at patients, we're well represented at our table. But lots of the healthcare professionals that are in our panel as well are also very patient-centered, and so I, I didn't feel like patients were absent from the table at all. Uh, but I don't, I did not pretend to try and represent all patients. But I, I think we had our basis covered. Uh, if I can also comment on the pediatrics, maybe maybe Alexander would mention this as well, but. Certainly pediatrics is a very interesting component, um, uh, especially since a lot of the drugs are not actually indicated for use in pediatrics. They're used off label and, you know, they're, they're adult drugs that get used in the pediatric world. And so it's a very sensitive area. We had pediatricians on the committee. And so uh, we had a lot of pediatric conversation at our table. Alexander, anything you would like to add from the pediatric or breadth of medicine, breadth of healthcare perspective from the panel? The question really did come in around pediatrics, but I assume people have similar questions about other areas, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. Yes, um, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Alan for his contributions regarding the patient-centered. And um, as somebody who does, in fact, uh, research uh, really focused on uh, lived and living experience. Uh, I can say that I feel that the dynamic that the panel created uh, was really quite respectful and uh, where we could, we privileged uh, patient voice. And so even just right here where um, Heather had turned first to Alan, you know, so um, I think that this was uh, reflects some of our processes. In terms of the pediatrics and breadth of medicine, uh, as Alan said, we had numerous, numerous discussions about uh, uh, some of these areas, and uh, I think really uh, tried to draw from a variety of expertise. I remember one of the panel members having posted uh, to uh, his colleagues and getting back responses. So it wasn't just um, those of us who were uh, on the panel, but also extending out through our networks and so on. Terrific. Thank you very much. The other two areas that were raised by participants are provincial drug plan experts, knowing that formularies around the country, and Alan, you are part of one of those uh, processes in Saskatchewan, um, were they represented and how could they be engaged? And I would offer first, and I'll turn to you, Alan, in a second, I would offer first, we would encourage and invite those panel representatives to submit feedback into this process. Um, we are engaged with federal, provincial, and territorial drug plan leads on a regular basis, but we also deliberately include a former drug plan lead in the province of Ontario um, who had years of expertise and connection with colleagues as well to bring that perspective to the table. But Alan, did you want to speak to this issue of um, experts from provincial formulary processes? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, a bit of a challenge because on one hand, we're also 
uh, we're, we're, we're making recommendations that are going to potentially impact how they function going forward. And so on one hand, we really do want their expertise, but we know that Cadet is well connected to those folks. Um, and, and as you say, there's, there's, there were some of us on the panel who have that expertise and have that, or not expertise, but that knowledge uh, of, of how those function. And, and really, I need to step back to look at, we're creating principles in a, in a, in a, in a test list, a starter list, uh, and we're testing some concepts as to how to move forward. I think the involvement of those people is really going to be critical in the next steps moving forward beyond what we're doing here. We're really, I think, starting to create the roadmap for uh, how the next steps or next phases of the work need to be done. And I think there's going to be much greater need for those people to be involved in the next steps as well. Thank you. Alexander, anything that you would like to add? No, okay. No, I think that it's been covered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with respect to industry participation, obviously we work very closely with the industry associations and individual companies as part of the submission based process. Um, and this opportunity was sent out to more than 11,000 of our subscribers, including um, of course, industry representatives. And we really hope that you will respond, ask questions and share your feedback um, through the process. Um, so thank you for raising that issue. Uh, Alan, I'm going to turn to you for the next question. There's a number of comments and questions that have come in around sustainability, around health economics, and uh, that representation or, or perceived lack thereof on the panel. Um, and so you talked about in your original part of the presentation around the tension between some of the principles. So um, equity and sustainability, for example. Can you talk a little bit about your how Envision balancing these two potentially competing priorities of access and sustainability? Well, there's no doubt they're competing. Um, and, and I expect that this will be finding this balance, um, assuming that the pan-Canadian formulary gets created, it will be a challenge for them going forward forever. This is going to be something that's going to be needed to look at on an ongoing basis. You know, filling the gaps uh, that exist right now between the various um, uh, private and public drug plans in this country is, is key. And that was really a central thing for the panel when we were talking about it. Um, and, and, you know, that means expanding coverage to people uh, who aren't receiving it now through, through whatever means. And that's, that's important. And I think, you know, again, this, we've got a sample, uh, we've got a starter list. It's a proof of concept. Um, you know, the, as, as things move forward, it's the existing or reinvented uh, health technology assessment and price negotiation processes that will come to play. And they will need to balance the benefits and the harms and the costs of drugs. And, and in order for it to be sustainable, there will need to be trade-offs between, uh, you know, given the, the price of, of, of new therapies, it's impossible for every person to have access to every drug that's out there. Uh, through this process, there will need to be some trade-offs and some balances. We think it's critical that those things uh, be anchored, those, those discussions be anchored in some principles that, that take us into a bit of a different space than the one we exist in right now in this country, um, that maybe shifts that balance. Um, but, uh, I, but I think that it's, uh, it's something that it, it needs to be done. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, there were also some things that, you know, there, it's out of scope uh, for the panel to look at individual costs, but, you know, the discussion, and I noticed there was a question about this in the, in the chat as well around biosimilars and generics, uh, you know, the panel supports the perspective taken in the Hoskins report in 2019, which is that biosimilars and generics should be used, that will help uh, control our costs and keep costs down and make those funds available for, for other therapies, and that that needs to be part of, part of this process as well. And so, even though, you know, getting into the specific cost discussion, was out of scope for us. Uh, we're quite cognizant of those things. And so I think going forward, it's about balancing. It's about making sure that this discussion about sustainability versus equity is front and center, and it's considered in every single review in the HTA process and in the, uh, in the price negotiation process. I, we can't be prescriptive. Uh, I, I don't think as a panel, we can't make a recommendation that's prescriptive about this. The circumstances, uh, we can't predict what the circumstances are going to be with every drug that comes forward. Uh, but I think we can set some principles out that uh, some touchstones that need to be looked at as these drugs are being evaluated going forward. Thank you, Alan. I'd like to build on that. There's a, a question coming in. I'll, I will take the liberty of reading it. And then, uh, Alexandra, I'm going to ask you to focus on a part of it. 
Um, so could you speak to the sustainability principle in the context of cost effectiveness and the link to social determinants of health? Um, patient health outcomes are more than a drug plan budget. And when I read this question, Alexandra, I think about um, the stories that you brought forward as a practicing, a, a practicing physician, having practicing physician colleagues and interacting with patients throughout your career um, to help people understand the choices and the impact of the choices that are made on a formulary. Is there anything you'd like to say about kind of social determinants of health in the panel's consideration and health outcomes as more than a drug plan budget? Um, wow. Uh, so the various health determinants, and we have uh, those that are quite proximal and those that are more upstream, um, obviously uh, have huge, huge impact on health. Uh, much more so than um, our healthcare system overall or a uh, drug plan within it. Um, and I think that we're cognizant of that and therefore have to be positioning this in the space that it belongs. Um, that being said, uh, I know that we've had various discussions about um, how um, the importance of equity in really thinking about um, how um, formularies need to be available for everybody uh, and how uh, there's a variety of different uh, situations that impact on things. So as an example, um, our core neighborhoods or uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, um, those who are in more rural remote areas versus urban centers. And um, uh, we have a bunch of um, other uh, things that are impacting such as uh, we have a considerable newcomer population, and within that group, which is not at all homogenous, there are a variety of different ways of knowing, different expectations of uh, healthcare, and so on. So um, I think that the um, health determinants are going to be quite impactful. Um, sorry, Heather, I, I feel that there was a second part to your question, and so if you can... Uh, so I think I actually think that you've answered uh, a good deal of it. Thanks very much, Alex. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so the question, really, the next question I'd like to pose really relates to related products. And Alan, maybe I could turn to you first and then to you, Alexandra. Um, so we've talked about related products and, and there are two questions. One is, do related products include um, uh, the testing, com companion testing that goes along with that. And I would, I would ask you just to respond uh, to that particular question, knowing that we're open for feedback is the point of this. So the panel has put forward a perspective uh, and we're open to feedback from stakeholders. And two, really, how do we identify those? How do we be sure? How is the panel sure that that list of related products it really is the, the best list to put uh, with this formulary process. So can you just speak a little bit to the panel's approach to um, related products uh, and definition? Yeah, thanks, Heather. I'm not sure I'm going to have an answer for all of that. I think that the panel is obviously supportive of including the related products. And there was a, a couple of elements to that. And, and one is that believing that, you know, the proper use of, for example, the, you know, the uh, additional tools used for inhalers, uh, it would improve the efficacy of, of the use of that drug. And that's important to assure a positive patient outcome from using the therapy. And so there's reasons like that, that I think we need to include them. Um, you know, it's a, but it's a, I, I, there's also funding for these in some sectors, in some provinces, in some of the programs, but they come from different departments within government. And it makes it a very, a big challenge for patients to put those pieces together. So this is one of those spaces where it needs to be streamlined, where there could be uh, a much more seamless approach for the patient if all of this stuff was bundled together. Having said that, there's a wide range of products and the wide, wide range of testing and, uh, you know, and drugs coming forward that have uh, testing that's required as part of the therapy itself. And so uh, that's where uh, my expertise, I'm going to hit the wall on very quickly here, and I'm not going to be able to answer some of that. But where the line is between, you know, in terms of what should be covered and what shouldn't be covered, I think that's going to be a discussion that's going to be ongoing. But I think that the principle that the panel had is that uh, where it's appropriate, they should be included as well in the formulary. Thank you. Alexandra, anything you'd like to add? 
Well, I think first of all, Alan uh, did a fabulous job there. But uh, again, we're thinking about uh, related products in ways that um, are either going to uh, improve uh, patient uh, adherence or compliance, um, the uh, acceptability of the uh, medications, and uh, ultimately uh, improve health outcomes. And so I think that that's going to have to be factored into uh, whatever the assessment process is. And uh, I, I know that we on the panel uh, considered a variety of different things. I think at this point, getting uh, feedback from stakeholders is really going to uh, help round things out and identify uh, considerations that uh, perhaps we didn't uh, so far. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alan, I'm going to turn to you now around alignment of formularies. So we've had two similar related questions around um, the alignment of formularies between hospitals and public uh, provincial formularies, and then formularies in long-term care and community. So can you talk, the panel did have some discussion about the importance of alignment across formularies, and as a patient and a, and a caregiver um, yourself, this is something that um, has come to the table and is, is key for patients, so I'm sure they'd like to hear your perspective. Yes, it is. And, you know, and it's, and it's interesting and I've had personal experience there, but also, you know, all the feedback I've seen, you know, from patients over the years as well for different drugs. Uh, patients don't really care that things need to come out of a different budget. If they need access to a drug, they need access to a drug. And if they move from the hospital out to the community or back, they don't understand or really care what the mechanisms are in behind that are preventing them from getting that access. And so I think, you know, it's about being seamless in, in the continuity of care. Uh, I know when I first got involved with the provincial formula, I was surprised to find that um, not only do the hospital formularies stand alone from the provincial formularies in most cases, I think, or in many, um, they also have different pricing that's not shared between them, right? And so there's, there's, there's a number of challenges that are there in the creation of that. But when I wear my patient hat, I look at like it, it needs to be, you know, a physician needs to know that they can, you know, uh, in conjunction with their patient prescribe a therapy, you know, if it starts in hospital, that when they leave hospital, they'll be able to continue on that therapy and not have to change to a different drug drug and potentially destabilize them in the process or vice versa if they're coming into the hospital. And so I think there needs to be consistency there. That's what patients are looking for. Thank you. And, and Alexandra, as a physician, obviously seeing patients in multiple different settings, this is a perspective from a prescriber as well as uh, for a pharmacist that was that is, is important. Would you add anything to, uh, to Alan's um, patient and family caregiver perspective? Yeah, well, I think that uh, the transition to and from uh, hospitals and other institutions um, can be uh, fraught with uh, trying to stabilize and maintain patients where um, they are. And um, therefore, this consistency across, I think, makes that a lot easier. So therefore, if somebody's coming into hospital being discharged from, we can look at uh, continuing the medications that are uh, appropriate. And uh, as Alan says, it, it can be um, uh, really impactful on health if medications are switched just because somebody is uh, coming home or going in. Um, so I think from that perspective, uh, we really are hoping for consistency. And again, feedback from stakeholders would uh, help to uh, clarify um, particular issues uh, that we may not have uh, perhaps identified. Thank you. There, I, just I, uh, one more comment that I can add to that too that just occurred to me as Alexander was talking and that's interprovincial mobility. Uh, you know, we, there's lots of stories. I have actually a personal experience with this, which my son, son for emergency reasons started therapy out of province. Uh, we had to get approval for him to be able to use that same drug coming back into this province. And so, and that happens a lot now where patients for one reason or another expertise in a different treatment center, or they happen to be traveling or whatever, but they, they're, they're out of province when they start a therapy and they find out that they can't actually continue that therapy when they come back into the province. And I know we receive, I've been part of these discussions discussions with the provincial formulary here in Saskatchewan where we've that's been a question that's come to uh, to our advisory committee which is okay this pro this person has started on this drug in uh, out of province and now they want to continue here should we allow it and having a national formulary that's consistent across the country in terms of availability eliminates all of those problems thank you I, uh, Alexandra, I'm going to come to you about a question related to appropriate clinical use of products and the panel's discussion 
um, around, a, you know, how a formulary might contribute to appropriate use based on what's selected uh, to go onto that formulary. But first, I just want to acknowledge we've have more than uh, 85 questions and comments that have come in. I apologize if we will not have time to answer them. Some of them are either very detailed and hard to answer in this setting, but we will strive to answer them after, uh, or they're duplicates similar uh, to other questions that have been answered. So if I'm not answering them, they're probably one of the two reasons why. Um, I do want to flag before I go to the question for you, Alexander, about um, appropriate use. There's a comment here to say, uh, thrilled with the types of discussions that are moving forward on behalf of patients and families. Um, waiting her and uh, their entire career for this kind of discussion. So to commend and thank um, everyone involved. So I just wanted to flag that to the panel and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Alexander, around the issue of appropriateness and choice of drugs on the formulary. Um, well, I think that uh, one of the things that we did want um, to make sure that the sample list reflected was in fact patient and clinician choice. Um, appropriateness in, in terms of uh, clinical indication and um, that uh, we're going back to a variety of different guidelines and so on, but also prescriber uh, preference. And um, uh, there, there is the notion of um, trying to uh, provide um, uh, sort of a range of options within a class. So therefore, uh, again, there are different medications that uh, people will respond to differently. And so this is part of both the art and science of medicine, I think. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure, did I? I think you've adequately uh, answered the question. Alan, is there anything that you wanted to add, thinking about this from a patient caregiver perspective? Um, no, I don't think I can add much there. Okay. I know we are about 10 minutes before the scheduled hour was set to end. Some of the questions as I've mentioned that we haven't answered, for example, um, when will this be implemented? Will Quebec be involved? Um, some of the health economics issues that have been raised really would be out of scope for the panel. So we'll flag them and make sure that uh, they're forwarded on. And certainly the panel has an opportunity to discuss those. Uh, I do wanna turn perhaps to Alan first and then to Alexandra. Um, just to offer any final comments that you may have about the work of the panel, the importance of input, um, anything you read, really would like to flag um, before we begin to think about closing the session. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, a few thoughts. Um, first off, I was super pleased to be involved in this process. Um, you know, like the other comment you uh, just read about people waiting a lifetime for this conversation. Uh, I'm one of those people. I, I, I think that the time is right in Canada for us to have a national formulary so that there is greater consistency across the country and we fill a bunch of, we fill the gaps. Uh, I think that that's really crucial. And so, you know, it's been, um, I know there's lots of limitations on our process, people have expressed lots of concerns about what's out of scope and what's in scope for us. Uh, I can tell you very clearly as a panel, we struggled with all of those same concerns at the beginning. We really wanted to have uh, put our fingers into uh, more questions than we were given the opportunity to do. But we also recognize the value of this particular piece, which I think is a really integral piece for the decision makers to have in making the next step so that they can continue the conversations around how to actually construct uh, a national uh, drug agency and a national formulary so that so we can build what I think we really need in this country. So uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have been involved and will continue to be involved in this process. It's an absolutely great panel. We've had some very invigorating and very uh, uh, mind bending conversations as we've gone through this. I expect we will have more as we go forward uh, based on the feedback and the, uh, based on the questions that I've been seeing come up. And I expect that those will show up in our feedback documents and, uh, you know, rest assured everybody, we will read all of them and and uh, we will learn from your feedback. And, and I look forward personally to, uh, to seeing it and, and uh, putting the finishing touches on, on this work. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Alexandra? Yes, um, thanks. Uh, so I, I think that uh, like Alan, I, I think there, we're at a really pivotal moment in our society. And this is actually on a number of fronts. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm a First Nation person and um, we have this whole um, reconciliation uh, agenda that is moving forward. Um, we 
uh, on the panel were talking about equity on a number of fronts, and uh, we really uh, uh, uplifted that principle as we were going through our discussions and deliberations. And I think that this is one of the things that we as Canadians really value. And so um, I, I found that the, as Alan says, the discussions were quite invigorating. Um, we had a variety of perspectives. And one of the things that for me uh, was quite uh, rewarding was that the respectful way in which we as panelists were engaging in multiple opinions, sometimes contradictory, and trying to uh, come up with um, a, an understanding that we could all um, put forward collectively. And um, so uh, this was a wonderful uh, experience and I think a really good piece of work that will inform what is going to come. Um, I appreciate that, uh, and, and this is with great humility, that there is all sorts of expertise uh, that are part of this session. and. Um, uh, and those who couldn't join. And so I think the stakeholder engagement process is going to be absolutely critical in um, helping to strengthen that, which I, I, I feel is a very good product uh, from the panel. Thank you very much. So knowing we only have a few minutes left, I would like to first of all, thank our panel uh, for an intense and important and committed effort. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff who have um, worked in the background to make much of this discussion possible to create a platform for the panel's work to occur. And of course, all of you for taking time today uh, to listen uh, and hopefully to provide us with feedback, share the information that is here, encourage your colleagues, um, organizations you work with to respond. Uh, your perspective is valued and will be shared with the panel and considered. Um, if you have questions, send them to us at requests at cadiff.ca. And of course, connect with us on any of these uh, different social media platforms. I wish you all a safe, healthy, um, snow-free soon day. And thank you again for your time today.